I'm Hog, this is The Dice, and we're going to return to the subject of marrow. The subject of this Irish folklore video was chosen by my patrons on Patreon. You can help vote to decide what kind of content I make by signing up for as little as $1 a month. Before we talk about the marrow, I would like to briefly talk about the folklore collectors who are operating in Ireland in the 19th century. See, I've spoken a lot on this channel, especially lately, about W.B. Yeats and how much I hate him. <laughs> And while he's certainly the worst offender, his methodology, such as it was, was fairly representative of that of his compatriots and peers of the time. Sir Douglas Hyde, Lady Gregory, Thomas Croft and Croker, the Wilds, they were all operating in a time before there were any rigorous standards for folklore collection. They were all members of the Protestant ascendancy. And while I wouldn't question their Irishness, I would say that they were still at a remove from the people whose stories they were collecting. And so they were taking them in and then representing them through a very, very different class and cultural lens. But most of all, they were all members of the Romanticist movement. And as such, they were more interested in portraying a romanticized view of Ireland and its folklore than they were in portraying an accurate one. Now, you may be wondering why exactly this is relevant to Merrow, or to Merrow in particular. The reason is that the term Merrow was first officially recorded by Thomas Crofton. Croker. Now, if you look through Croker's work, you'll find a lot of Irish words and a lot of Hiberno-English spelled out phonetically, from an Anglo-centric point of view, at least. And this is less than great. Now, we could, of course, attribute this habit to the fact that he was collecting in a time where there was no actual training for folklore collectors and also no standards. But Croker frames this as genuinely being the Hiberno-English term that was used to refer to mermaids. It was supposed to be the anglicized form of words like murduach and murduchaun. However, while the original Irish words do appear in the National Folklore Archive several times, the word marrow, as far as I was able to find, only appeared once, and that as a surname. And that archive, it was compiled by actually competent collectors barely a hundred years after Croker claimed the word marrow. However, if you search ducas.ie for the English word mermaid, you will find, just, just let me check here, um, 285 stories and 564 transcripts. So if I'm going to be entirely honest, I think the word mermaid was probably the common English word used for creatures like Mordukhaun. And that Croker just didn't like that. It didn't line up with the portrayal of Ireland he wanted people to see. And so he fudged an anglicized term because he wanted the people of Ireland to have their own culturally unique term for the creature. This is the problem with romanticists. Now there's two iconic Marrow stories. One is titled The Soul Cages, 
and was collected by Thomas Knightley. However, in a letter to one of the brothers Grimm, and don't get me started on them, Knightley admitted that he had just adapted the soul cages from a German fairy tale. Though he claimed that, by sheer coincidence, a similar story was told in Cork and in Wicklow. Now that's possible, but I have yet to see any evidence for that. However, in that same letter, he also said that it wasn't his idea to adapt the German fairy tale. It was, in fact, the idea of Thomas Crofton Croker, which, in a way, brings me to the second iconic Merrow story. The Lady of Gullerus, collected by Thomas Crofton Croker. This story centres around a fisherman named Dick Fitzgerald, who essentially kidnaps a Merrow, forces her to marry him, and she later discovers her Kahleen Riacht and flees. Now, variants of this story are told all over Ireland, and there are many different versions of it in the Dukas archive. However, very few of them name the fisherman, and none of them, as far as I could tell, gave him the name Dick Fitzgerald. The other thing is that the stories I found in the archive all more closely resemble each other than they do the Lady of Gullerys. So it would seem that Thomas Crofton Croker adapted the Lady of Gullerys from an extant Irish folktale about Merrow. Not dissimilar to what Thomas Knightley had done with the soul cages, but at least the story he was adapting was from the right country. However, all of this does not mean that the term Merrow is not a legitimate term to use with modern Irish folklore. So folklore is by its very nature changeable and cannot have a fixed canon. And though Croker may have invented the term Merrow, it has entered into the popular discourse and has become a common term. So it can now said to be part of the current folklore regarding Irish mermaids, even if it was not really a part of the past folklore regarding them. If I am correct, Thomas Crofton Croker and his compatriots succeeded in working this new term into the folklore of Ireland. Now, earlier, more mythological depictions of Merrow were drastically different to the kind of creature we talk about today. For example, the Dinsancus of Waterford described the Merrow as singing to lull sailors to sleep, that they may prey upon them. And their visual, physical description was also very, very different. Now, their top half was, as you may expect, described as looking like the gorgeous body of a young woman of about average size. However, Things take a different turn when their bottom half is described. As much of them as was underwater, it was a secret with no kindly power, was big as a broad, bright hill of shellfish and heaps of weed. I think you'll agree that having as their bottom half a seething, gigantic mass of shellfish and seaweed is something of a departure from how we would picture mermaids and marrow today. And speaking of marrow as cosmic horrors, Fuck you, Cthulhu! You've been replaced! The annals of the Four Masters report the corpse of a 195 foot tall marrow washing up on the shore of Scotland. Now, this may of course actually be referencing a beached whale, as later stories do connect marrows and whales. In one story, a man has married a marrow, and unusually by her choice. 
However, she leaves him and curses his family after he kills a whale, which was her brother. One aspect of Mero stories that has become more popular as the years have worn on is the Kotlin Drift. That translates very loosely as Little Magic Cat. The Kotlin Drift is either a cap or a hat or a hood or a cape or a cloak or in at least one case a hairnet that is coloured red and allows the Mero to breathe underwater when warm. When they remove the Kotlin Drift, they can breathe on land. In many Mero stories, a fisherman or a sailor or some man who comes upon a Mero will steal the Kotlin Drift away and use that to force the Mero to remain on land and to marry him. Now, the Kotlin Drift is usually recovered, usually many, many years later. At some point, the husband will have to leave the house for some time and one of their children will accidentally find the cat and bring it to the mother wondering what it is or the mother will find it herself by accident while cleaning the house. And at that point, she will usually leave, sometimes taking the children with her, sometimes turning them to stone or into seals, and sometimes she takes them with her and they just drown. Though sometimes she will just abandon them to the husband. In other stories, like the one about the Mero and her brother the whale, the husband will do something to violate a condition that she has placed upon him, rather like a gyasa. And that will cause her to leave the marriage and abandon the husband. Mero, or rather Murdukhaun, likely first entered Irish folklore through Greek mythology, as the earliest Murdukhaun stories closely resemble stories of Greek sirens. And before anyone says it, I know the original Greek sirens were bird women, but they became very quickly conflated with mermaids. This is not a modern phenomenon. It has been happening for centuries. But they quickly developed their own unique characteristics and have become something somewhere between the classical mermaid and the Scottish Selkie. Okay, so who had money on Mero being horrible cosmic horrors because I didn't at first but yeah Marrow, Mermaids, Mordukhaun whatever you want to call them they are vast cosmic horrors wonderful or at least they were at one point anyway thank you for watching this video also a uh, big thank you to Keith Byrne for providing some lovely art of, uh, of dejected Cthulhu and to Kate Nix for being my marrow for this video. If you liked the, the mermaid rights activist shirt Kate was wearing, uh, there is a link to where you can buy that in the video description. But thank you also to the great Ash Carp, first of her name, master of the mad... Keeper of the magic carp and empress of the great shiny sea, Queequeg, and all of my other patrons, many of whose names are scrolling across the screen as I speak, and to anyone who has done something like, like the video, left a comment, subscribed, or even watched the video to the point where they are hearing me talk now. All of those things are actually very, very helpful. So, thank you all. If you want to be able to help decide what kind of videos I make in the future, all of my patrons get to vote on polls deciding the topics of my Irish folklore videos. And yeah, yeah, that's, that's everything. Thanks. Bye.